Hello and welcome to another episode of From the Beginning here at Heavenward Thinking. Today we're in Genesis chapter 9. We're starting with the second half. Last week we talked about uh, the promise of God's covenant with Noah and with his descendants that he would not destroy the earth again with a flood. We finished the whole flood narrative and we examined some of the uh, significant points of the rainbow and of all kinds of different things of how important it is to remain faithful to God and to do all that he's commanded us just as Noah did. And, and today we get to see Noah's descendants, a little story about about, uh, Noah after the flood uh, and some sin that came around again. We see the results of sin even after the flood when God wiped away the wickedness and the violence of men. We see it comes right back, more sin entering the world. Uh, and then we're going to get to see uh, kind of the, the table of nations uh, and then get ready to prepare ourselves for the Tower of Babel and the spreading out of humanity and the confusion of our languages. And all that's going to really come about in the next couple weeks. But here we're going to start in Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 18 today. It says, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So from this passage, uh, it's a less familiar passage than the flood narrative that we just went through, uh, but it's an important one because it once again shows us the problem that we're still dealing with in the world of sin. Even though God removed the wickedness uh, of the rampant, raging wickedness of mankind through the flood by destroying every living thing other than Noah and his family and the animals that God sent to Noah two by two to go on the ark, male and female, other than that, he destroyed the rest of the earth. And yet we still see the effects of sin. There's still a sin-cursed world. Because of our sin in the Garden of Eden, sin and its effects would still continue. And we see that right after, immediately after uh, the account of, of Noah and the awesome account of how he... Uh, gives praise and glory to God and how God creates a covenant uh, with Noah and his descendants. Uh, right after that, we get uh, something that puts us in a different perspective, seeing that there's still a problem. There's still going to be a long battle between good and evil. God eventually is going to win. He's going to eventually send a redeemer, a savior, Jesus Christ, uh, just as he saved and provided a, a salvation means for Noah and his family. One day, he is going to do the same, and he did that uh, through the person of Jesus Christ on the cross in the New Testament. But still here in the Old Testament, we're going to be dealing with a lot of the effects of sin, and it's going to get worse again as we go throughout it. But here, right away, we get a, an account of sin still being a problem, and we see uh, different actions by different people. Noah decided to uh, get drunk on wine, uh, which is a problem throughout Scripture. Scripture tells us not to get drunk on wine. It doesn't say that wine's bad. It says that we're not to be getting drunk because that leads to problems. And we see here that it leads to a problem that Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Rather than honoring and respecting his father, uh, he didn't do that. He disrespected him. Uh, and fortunately, the two other brothers, Shem and Japheth, took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. They did the right thing. They respected their father, uh, which uh, forms a basis for what we're going to see when we get to the Ten Commandments of how important it is to honor your father and mother and not to disrespect them. And when we see here that this uh, is a sin problem, uh, that there was disrespect going on already in this uh, reset of the world that we, we have here. And we see the different reactions of these sons of Noah and how one made a poor choice and two made the right choice. And once again, it calls us, us and it applies us uh, to us just as well as in this biblical text that we need to be doing what is right. We need to be following after God, doing what is right, respecting other people, even if others fail to do that, even if others uh, sin, we need to do what's right and stand on the word of God and do what we know is right. Just like these two sons of Noah who did the right thing, even when they could have easily given into the, the temptation to do the wrong thing like their brother, they did the right thing and they made a stand. And we're going to see that all throughout scripture as we continue to go on. People making stands even when those around them fall, even when those around them sin and try to get them to do the same thing they're doing. 
we have to remember to make stands for Jesus, to be different than those around us. In our world today, we see uh, many of the same patterns as we've talked about here on the show already, many of the same patterns that were in Noah's day, and we know that eventually it's going to get even worse, and, and that Jesus himself said that it's as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. And, and we have to realize that things are going to continue to get worse in this world, but as Christians, our ultimate hope is in Jesus Christ and in the world to come, the new heaven and the new earth. So we need to be willing to make stands even when the world is so dark. We have to shine the light of Christ. Just as these two sons did the right thing, so we have to do the right thing in our own lives. And at the very end, there's another thing that stands out to me in this chapter. In verse 28, just a short verse, and then 29, also short. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So we see that Noah lived a long time after uh, the world had the reset, after the flood, uh, after that great catastrophe in our history, uh, that whole uh, reset that came about because of our sin, God putting an end to the crazy wickedness and violence that we saw in uh, chapter 6, 7, and, and 8. Uh, we saw the flood account, and we finished off in chapter 9 with that. And then we see that uh, we have that reminder, just as we had back in chapter 5, when we had uh, the passage of descendants after Adam, and we had, and he died, and he died, and he died. We had that com com uh, that repeating phrase that continued to repeat. Uh, and we see that here again in verse 29, and he died. It shows us once again that there is still a consequence for sin, that, that the consequence for sin is death. Even someone as righteous as Noah, who did the right thing, who did all that God commanded him, as we saw time and time again that scripture says, even though he did the right thing, he still had to face the consequences of sin, which was death. But he had his faith in God, and he did what God wanted him to do. And we have to do that same thing. Even though we may face difficulties and trials, we have to do the right thing and continue to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Continue to have our faith in our God. Also today, we're going to go into Genesis chapter 10. We're going to tie that in with the chapter we just did. Uh, since this is the uh, nations descended from uh, Noah, it's a chapter that we often skip over. It has tons of hard pronunciations. Uh, we're going to do our best to go through that and see what points we can get, even from a difficult chapter. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 10, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripha, and Togomar. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dadanin. From the, these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Zabta, Rama, and Zabteca. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalma in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Reboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is a great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Ananim, Lehabim, Naphtalim, Pathrasum, Chalcihim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar, as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpashad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpashad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jactan. Jactan fathered Almadad, Shelef, Hazarmatheth, Jara, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abinamal, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Jactan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. 
So see here in Genesis chapter 10, we have a whole list of the nations descended from Noah, his sons. We see all of that and they're, how uh, they're going to eventually disperse throughout the land. And we see here that they're doing at least one of the things that God commanded mankind to do, which was to multiply and increase greatly on the earth. Part of the subduing the earth, part of that uh, creation mandate to rule over creation, part of that was to multiply. And we see that here as uh, Noah's sons had even more sons and daughters, and they had all of these generations after them and how they formed great nations. And we see here some notable people that are talked about, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And even though we don't get great details about some of these people, we do get some details and, and highlights of mighty cities that they built and of, of lands and nations that we know uh, and that are referenced throughout Scripture and that become very important in later uh, chapters of Genesis and Exodus and all throughout uh, the Old Testament and New Testament. And we see here uh, the beginning of nations that is going to come into a huge play in Genesis chapter 11 when we have the Tower of Babel and when mankind is forced to spread across the world and fill the world as they were commanded to, to increase and to fill and spread and uh, to multiply throughout the world, not just stay in one little section, which we'll see that that caused some severe problems and God had to come down and confuse the languages of mankind so that they would do what he said, that they would obey and listen to him rather than try to do things for their own. They tried to substitute man's authority and man's word for God's authority and God's word. And once again, we've talked about that many times here at From the Beginning on Heavenward Thinking. We have been talking about there's two concepts that are always at battle. They're out of battle in our world. They were at battle in Genesis. It's either God's word, God's authority, or man's word and man's authority. And that's the two the two concepts that are always in conflict, always doing battle. That's why we see huge divides between Christianity and the secular world. And we wonder why they're not living the way we want them to live or the way that we think they should live or that they should know how. Well, they have a different basis than us. They have man's word and man's authority. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see all kinds of behaviors that go against scripture. We need to do our job to shine brightly for Jesus and, and deal with those foundations and help people get a solid foundation of scripture so that they're not uh, basing their life on the foundation of man's word and man's authority, which is not ultimate and which is not fail-proof. We need it to be based on the fail-proof, inerrable word of God that is our solid rock, our solid foundation, and, and base our life on God's authority, not our own authority. So we're going to see that that created a, a huge problem. They didn't listen to God. And they tried to do things for their own name, make a name for themselves. We're going to see that here. But here in Genesis chapter 10, even though it's a long chapter full of long, complicated names that most of us don't know how to pronounce, at all, there's some things we can take away from it, such as mankind uh, increasing, spreading throughout the world again after the flood. And we see here nations forming even after the catastrophe of the flood. And that's going to play a huge role as we move forward here. So I hope you've learned something from this, uh, this show on Heavenward Thinking. Uh, we encourage you to watch the other shows if you've missed one from, from the beginning uh, and to really read your scripture. Get in the word. Make sure you're reading it for yourself, studying it. it. It's hard work in some of these chapters like Genesis chapter 10, but it's still worth it even in these complicated chapters. It's worth it to really study the word of God because all of it is useful for teaching. All of it is useful uh, for growing yourself spiritually in the Lord and in the knowledge of his word. So I'd encourage you to do that and then join us next time for another episode of From the Beginning here at Heavenward Thinking.